All right, good morning, familia. Could you please stand for the reading of God's Word? We're going to be reading from Nehemiah chapter uh, 5. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 12. Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Now the men and their wives, wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying... We and our sons, our daughters, are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others are saying, we have to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and though our children are as good as theirs... Yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. Verse 6. When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered, um, I pondered them in my mind, and then I accused the nobles and the officials. I told them, you are charging your own people interest. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as, as far as possible, we have brought back our fellow Jews who were sold, into, uh, sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. Verse 9. So I continued, what are you doing? What you're doing is not right. You shouldn't, walk in the, shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. But let us stop charging interest. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, uh, and houses, and also the interest you are charging them, 1% of the money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. Verse 12. We will give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will, we will do as you say. Then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. This is the word of the Lord. Lord, we know that we as human beings, um, we come and go. But the only thing that stays forever and endures forever is your word. Please speak to us this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Sorry there for the confusion. For those of you that sat before time. Um, don't think that I don't notice that stuff. I noticed everything. <laughs> Today we continue with our series in a ba uh, based on the book of Nehemiah. And we are learning what it means to be restored people. Uh, the restoration that we have experienced because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, the restoration that the gospel brings to people. The interesting thing about this restoration that we find in the gospel is that, that it doesn't leave us the way we are. The gospel transforms people, and it tells us how is it that we ought to live. The gospel is powerful for salvation, is the power of God for salvation, and the gospel is the power of God for transformation. Today we're learning that one of the evidences of that transformation is that we become merciful people. At least that we want to become merciful people. And I have three points for you today, all based on, uh, on the text that we just read from Nehemiah. A merciful person requires, so it's required of a merciful, uh, merciful person to learn to hear the pain Repair the broken and love in fear. That's what a merciful person looks like. Is someone that learns how to hear the pain, repair the broken, and love in fear. So we're going to go with the first one here, hear the pain. So for those of you that have not been walking with us through this series, let me give you a little bit of context here. One thing that we have been learning through the book of Nehemiah is that Nehemiah was a man that saw what God was doing. And he decided that he wanted to contribute to what the Lord was already doing. So Nehemiah's task was to help God's people restore the walls of the city of Jerusalem. 
Because he understood that by doing that, not only the, the, the Israelites will be protected from the, their enemies, there will be a restoration of the city, but also there will be a restoration of their hearts, a spiritual restoration. Part of the reason why I know that that's what's happening here is because in Nehemiah's mind, to secure the city was also freedom from them, for them to practice what the Lord has called them to practice for spiritual growth. So what we, what we see in here in the book of Nehemiah is the restoration of, of the physical, there's a, restora- there's a physical and a spiritual restoration at the same time. Now, the text we just read happened two months in this restoration process, or after this restoration process. Actually, we know that these walls are almost done. And even though Nehemiah has experienced some opposition... God has been faithful, and God has been protecting his people, and God has been defending his people. This is the irony, though, of the text that we have today. Is that even though these uh, these people were uh, building this wall to protect themselves from outside enemies, these walls were not strong enough to protect them from their greater enemy, their heart. That's the irony of the text, that even though they were, pro- they, they were doing everything in their power to keep the enemy out, they were not paying attention to the enemy within themselves. And that's why we've got to talk about this subject. And that's the reason why in two different occasions in this text, we, found, we find the word outcry. We see it in verse 1 when it says, Now the men and their wives raised great outcry against their fellow Jews. Notice that word there. And then in verse 6, he says it again. When I heard the outcry of these charges, I was very angry. Now the word outcry there is significant because in the original, it's not just an expression of pain and distress. The word outcry in the original means... This is what a person uh, does once this person has been the victim of injustice. It's not just physical pain. It's someone that is um, expressing something within them because they feel that they have been victims of injustice. That's why I think that a good synonym of the word outcry here is someone that has experienced indignation. You know what that word means? It's when you feel, as a human being, that your dignity and your value as a human being has been violated. That's what these people are going through. Actually, when you look throughout the Bible and you follow the concept of injustice, you will see that every injustice in the Bible is the product of of a violation of the value and a dignity of a human being. It's all throughout the Bible. Now, what makes this narrative even worse than what we're thinking of here now is that the people that are inflicting these things, the people that are exercising injustice, are fellow brothers and sisters. Part of the same family. This is brothers hurting brothers, sisters hurting sisters. So the question is, what was the injustice here? Well, let me, I think it's important that we understand that... um, When God called these people to rebuild this wall, God is calling them, all of them, to a step of faith. The reason why I'm saying that is because in order for these people to rebuild this wall, which it would take more or less two months, they had to stop working. So whatever they were doing before, they had to stop doing in order to dedicate themselves completely to rebuild this wall. Therefore, It was expected that there was great need in the community. Now, I'm going to walk you through this and show you what these people are going through. Some people are saying, for example, that they don't have enough food because there's just way too many of them. And we see that in verse 2. We and our sons, our daughters are numerous. We don't have enough food for all of us. Now, some other people are saying that because of that, They're having to lose everything, the very few things they have. They are mortgaging their fields and their vineyards and their homes because there was a great famine. 
Now, this is what people are going through. Now, there's another group of people that are in so much need that they cannot pay their taxes. And they're having to surrender their kids to slavery. And we see that in verse 4 and in verse 5. We have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Now look at verse 5. We have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. I'll explain that a little bit more. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless. Now, the reason why I, won, I, I highlighted the word daughters there in two different occasions is because some scholars argue that what's happening here is that because of people's needs, they're having to give their, their daughters away uh, to different men as a second wife. Now, in, in that context and at that time, that was legal. There was nothing wrong with a younger girl marrying an older man. That was not the issue. It's actually, it was not actually the issue that if you were uh, in need, you could surrender yourself as a slave for a period of time until you pay off your debt. There was not, that was not the issue. By God's grace, we don't practice that today, but that was not the issue. The issue here is that there are men among the community that are seeing the misery of others as an opportunity to benefit themselves. That was the issue. The problem here is that we got a group of people that are seeing the necessity of others as an opportunity to benefit themselves. That was the problem. And these people are saying we are powerless. And that phrase kills me because it, another way to translate that is to say there's nothing I can do. Now, if you have, if you have, if you have kids, I want you to stop there and think as a parent. How desperate do you have to be in order for you to have to do that and feel powerless? That's the injustice. Not enough food, no income, mortgages, taxes, kids being sold into slavery, and people taking advantage of this. This is a violation of the human dignity. This is a violation of human of, a, of the value of a human being. What would you do if you were Nehemiah? So I want, you to, I want to show you what was Nehemiah's reaction. Because I think that that's the most godly reaction when you hear and see things like that. In verse 6 says, When I heard the outcry and these charges, I was very angry. Now, the word angry there is an important word because it's not this, this outburst of emotional anger. Like, ah, uh, That's not what's happening there. It's not a reaction. Actually, the root of the word anger there is the same root that we find for the word zeal. And I'm assuming that you understand the concept, but when someone experiences zeal for something, is when you love something or someone so much that you care for something or someone so much that if that person is hurt, you feel hurt. That if that person is struggling, you struggle with them. That if they have an issue, it becomes your issue. Once again, if you're a parent, I want you to think as a parent to understand the text. Someone once said that happiness finishes once we have kids. <laughs> oh, hold on, let me explain. Because your happiness is conditioned to their happiness. And it's so true. I have two daughters. When they suffer, I suffer with them even if I don't want to. If they struggle, I struggle with them even if I don't want to. My wife says that this is when she turns into mama bear. If someone hurts my daughters, you will see my wife. That's the word anger there. That's the word zeal there. And this is what Nehemiah is experiencing when he sees the injustice that people are going through. See, a merciful person 
It's, it's a person that learns how to hear the pains of others. Hears the pains of others. A merciful person is a person that learns how to sympathize with the pain of others. A merciful person is a person that wants to do something when injustice has taken place. A merciful person is a person that recognizes that human beings created in the image of God, regardless of, what they, of where they come from or what they have done. They have value and dignity. Because whenever a human being experiences injustice, it's a violation of their dignity and value, and we ought to do something to fix it. See, a merciful person always hears the pain. Listen up. To choose not to hear the pain is to act, is to be indifferent. And indifference is worse than hating a person. Did you know that? Because when you hate a person, you acknowledge that a person at least exists. But indifference is when you say to someone that is struggling, I don't care what you go through, because you have no value, no dignity, you are not worthy of my care, you are nothing, you don't exist. That's indifference. Listen to the words of Elie Wiesel, which is a writer and a survivor of the Holocaust. He would say this, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. The opposite of art is not ugliness, it's indifference. The opposite of faith is not heresy, it's indifference. And the opposite of of life is not death, it's indifference. There's nothing worse than a Christian, especially, that is indifferent to the pain and the struggles of others. So um, this week I'm going through my rooted, I'm doing rooted for the first time. I was part of a life group and now I'm doing rooted, rooted this, uh, this semester. And I was reminded in a conversation. Uh, we were actually talking about what it means to be created in the image of God. And I remember uh, that during my first year as a Christian, first year as a Christian, I experienced something that changed, uh, that changed me completely. I, I, I don't think I'm ever going to forget what I experienced that one time. Um, so one of the things that the Lord did to me right from the beginning is I, he gave me this desire to help people in need. That, that's kind of how it happened. Right, And so I gathered this group of young people from my church, tiny little church in Merrill's Park. And every Sunday, Saturday morning, we would go downtown to kind of, you know, pass out food and sandwiches and soup, this terrible soup that we used to make, uh, uh, and then give out food and then share the gospel. That was the whole plan, right? And I remember one, day, one Saturday, I, I had just spent a few minutes with a, with a man uh, uh, trying to convince him the necessity of Jesus and all that stuff, and he completely rejected me. So I, I finish my conversation, then I, I stand to the side, and I'm just praying, I'm just looking at the guy, I'm praying. Now, this is Michigan Avenue, right? And everyone is walking by, and I saw this man walking by this homeless guy, right? And he's on the phone. I, I, I mean, I wish I could forget his face. And uh, he, he, he reaches into his pocket, and the homeless is over there, and he throws the coins away and keeps going. And then I saw this poor man crawling on the ground trying to catch those coins. And I remember feeling this anger. He was treating this poor man as less than a human being. Dehumanized him. Treated him as a thing, almost like an animal. And I remember that I would say, I'm not going to be like that. Because merciful people, here's the pain. That was the whole concept behind the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. Actually, I, I want to invite you to read that again, because Jesus there says, if you want to know how much you are willing to love your neighbor, check how much you are willing to exercise mercy. 
No mercy, no love. Hear me out. No mercy, no love. And the mercy was extended to people that are not like us, that didn't live like us, that haven't done the things that we have done. That's mercy. How do you know if you are experiencing a spiritual restoration? Well, because we become merciful people. Or at least we want to become merciful people. People that learn to hear the pain of others. All right, so the next question is, once you're here, what, what is it that we ought to do? Then this is the second point right here. Well, we are called to learn to try to repair the, repair the broken. Now, I want to show you what Nehemiah did. The text tells us that he not only, he didn't just react, but he spent some time thinking about what, what needed to be done. And then he goes and confronts the people that needs to be confronted. And we see this in verses 7 and 8. Look at here. I ponder them in my mind and I accuse the nobles and officials. Look at verse 8. And then he tells them, now you are selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. And I love this text because he tells us this. He's confronting them by saying, you are treating our fellow brothers as slaves. You are treating these kids as slaves. But what I love about this is that he understands that to exercise mercy requires that we say what needs to be said. A merciful person is a person that is willing to speak on behalf of the afflicted. That's what we hear in Psalm 82. Defend the weak and the fatherless, uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed, Rescue the weak and the needy, delivering them from the hand of the wicked. Speaking, defending, speaking on behalf of the ones that nobody else does. See, I think that as a church, not just this church, the church in general, we need to grow in this area. And I know, listen, I was going through some testimonies this week, and some of you guys already do this. But I will say that that's the exception. I think that as church, we, we got to learn how to speak against acts of injustice. Because that's what Psalm 82 calls us to do. That's what Nehemiah says that we ought to do. If we don't speak on behalf of the afflicted, who will? If we don't speak on behalf of the afflicted, Who's going to do that? And Nehemiah doesn't just stop speaking about this or talking about this or uh, fighting for these people, but he, he decides to do something. Now you see that in verse 9. He says, what, are you, what, you're doing right now, what, what you're doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of God to avoid the, the reproach of the Gentile? Gentile enemies, and then verse 10 says, let us stop charging interest. And in verse 11, give back to, give back to them immediately. Notice here, he's, he's confronting what needs to be confronted, and now he's taking action. He wants to fix the problem. Once again, if you go to Luke chapter 10, that is the parable of the Good Samaritan. We do something to fix the problem. When there's something wrong, we do something to fix the problem. The merciful person knows that when there are acts of injustice, you cannot afford to be a spectator. Listen, there's two different ways in which we can sin. One, by doing something that is wrong. That is called sinning by commission. But we also sin when we don't do what is right. That is sinning by omission. How is it that as a nation, we can see injustice, injustice and stay quiet? 
We, we cannot afford to be bystanders. We act, we say, we do. Listen to what God says to the Israelites in Isaiah chapter 58. He says, free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind them. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Clothe, uh, give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. Remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Feed the hungry and help those in trouble. That's one of the reasons why as a church we believe one of our values is generous justice. We want the entire church to seek and care for the under-resourced and the vulnerable. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to be restored people. That's what it means to be people of the kingdom. That's what it means to believe the gospel and live in light of the gospel. I don't know if you're familiar with William Booth, the founder of Salvation Army. This is what he says at the beginning of his ministry. While women weep, as they do now, I'll fight. While children go hungry, as they do now, I'll fight. Well, men go to prison in and out as they, go, as they do now, I'll fight. Well, there's a drunkard left. Well, there's a poor lost girl upon the streets. Well, there remains one dark soul without the light of God, I'll fight. I'll fight to the very end. Curry Ten Boom in her book, The Hiding Place, says that there was one prayer that changed her life. She said, Lord Jesus, I offer myself for you people in any way, any place, any time. That's a radical prayer. I offer myself to your people for your people in any way, any place, and any time. See, a merciful person hears the pain and wants to restore the broken. We cannot do it all. But we can do some. Because of that, then I will have an invitation for you. Okay? Something very practical. So here, if this is the first time you ever heard about this, which I doubt it. But let's say that this is the first time you hear about this. Or the Lord is speaking to you this for the first time on this one. This is what I want you to do. I want you to pray that your eyes and ears will be open to injustice. To injustices. Just ask the Lord to give you the eyes to see and the ears to hear. And start searching for injustice around you. You have to remember that wherever you are, the Lord placed you there. There's no mistakes. You remember what I told you what Nehemiah did? He noticed what the Lord was already doing and he stepped into it. That's kind of what we do as Christians. Now, let's say that you already do this. Then go to the first steps. You know, take a cause. You know, here as a church, we partner with Safe Families, and we have Carefest, and we have Puente, and, and, and we want the people to talk, about, uh, talk against abortion, for example, and poverty. But don't go so far, because we are surrounded by immigrants. One immigrant is speaking to you today. Well, see what their needs are. Contribute to what the Lord is doing. Participate in the kingdom. And let's say that you already do that. Then the next step would be start giving generously of your time, money, and skills. So this is the challenge. All right? Listen up. If you are a professional, something extremely practical, if you are a professional, you might want to consider using your abilities and your talents and your gifts pro bono for the people that could never pay you back. Because we care for the afflicted and the needy and the one in our community that needs something. Disadvantage yourself for the advantage of others. Disadvantage yourself for the sake of the kingdom. So pray about it, think about it. Maybe the Lord is calling you to do something else. Now the question, the last question I have to ask is, how do we, how do we change? How do we turn into people like this? And the answer goes 
something like, like this. You got to learn how to love. But the only way you, we can learn how to love is when we first experience the fear of God. Which this is my third point. We got to learn how to love in fear. Now, let's read. Let me show you verse 9 here for a second. It says right there, this is Nehemiah confronting his people. And he says, shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? And what Nehemiah here is doing is confronting them, calling them to do something, to walk in the fear of God. And at the same time, he's showing us what was the driving force behind everything he did. And the driving force behind everything he did was the fear of God. Now, if you grew up in church, you have heard that, that phrase many, many, many times. But just in case you don't know what that phrase means, let me explain it to you. Martin Luther used to make a distinction between something that he called um, a servile fear and a filial fear. A servile fear is, is kind of dread or terror. Is the kind of fear that a, that a prisoner feels once he knows that he's going to be executed because of something he did wrong. Is the fear of punishment. This is the kind of fear that people without God feels when they think of God. Punishment. But the filial fear is the ones that Christians experience. It's kind of a family fear. So if you are a parent, this is what you kill your you kill. This is what your kids supposed to feel at home. It's a family fear. It's a loving fear. Let me read what um, Paige Brown, which is a, 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 a Bible teacher, an amazing Bible teacher, she says this. Filial fear is the love and adoration of a child for a father whom he so dearly wants to please. He feels fear not because he's a, he has any dread of, or, or terror of punishment, but because he's eager to avoid displeasing or offending that one that is the source of his security and love. Like, that's what I want from my daughters. I want them to fear me, but not afraid of me, but to fear me because I love them and I want the best for them. And Nehemiah knows that God is like that. Nehemiah understands that God is the source, his source of security and love. Nehemiah knows that there's nothing he could do to lose God. Nehemiah knows that God is for him and not against him. And the reason why I'm saying that is because in the first chapter of Nehemiah, verse 11, as he's doing this prayer we went through, he says, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant who delights to fear in your name. It's a complete different, it's a, it's a complete different relationship with God. See, the reason why Nehemiah became the man that he was supposed to become, the reason why Nehemiah cares for the afflicted, the reason why he's willing to speak on behalf of those that experience uh, injustice, the reason why he's willing to do something is because he knows he has experienced the fear of God. If that is true for Nehemiah before the cross, can you imagine what we have after the cross? If for Nehemiah, his security and love was God without Jesus, can you imagine the security and love we have in Jesus? See, I believe that as Christians, we have no excuse. Because we know what it means to be afflicted. And we know what it means to have a God that cares for us. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus is the better and greater Nehemiah. See, we know what it means to be recipients of mercy. We know what it means that God doesn't give us what we don't deserve. That's why Jesus went to the cross, to give us what we don't deserve. See, we know what it means to have someone speaking on your behalf. Because Jesus is standing on the right side of the God, in, of the Father, interceding for you all the time. See, we know what it means to suffer and have someone that cares enough to do something. That's why Jesus is our Savior. 
We were dead in our sins and trespasses as he came for us and he came to us. We know what it means to be rescued. See, to the degree that you understand that, to the degree that you embrace that, to the degree you understand that Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection, it was an expression of mercy. To the, the more we have that, the more we become like him. The more we care for the things he cares. The more we love the things he loves. The more we can go to him and say, Lord Jesus, I offer myself for your people in any way, any place, and any time. That's what the church ought to be. That's how we know that we are experiencing spiritual restoration. Amen? Can you do me a favor? Can you please stand so we could pray together? Lord, at the beginning of our service, we were singing about Zion, the future Zion, the, the new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem. The one that is descending from heaven, making all things new. Taking away pain, taking away suffering, taking away anything that destroys your creation. Taking away anything that violates the dignity and value of human beings. That's the picture of what is yet to come. And then we went through the Beatitudes, Lord. What it means to be people of the kingdom. And now we learn from Nehemiah. I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you give us a picture of Jesus so and so big, so and so perfect, so and so beautiful, that we become like him. That we understand what he did for us in the cross in such a way that we become merciful people. Please forgive us, Lord, if we have seen injustice and we have said nothing. Please forgive us, Lord, if we have seen injustice and done nothing. Lord, in Jesus, we have nothing to lose because everything is secure in him. And in Jesus, we have nothing to gain because we have it all in him. Help us to offer our lives for others in any time any place, and in any way you want. And we pray for all of this in the name of Jesus. And we say...